We're going to talk about depression today and like how to manage your tics a little bit. Because on the survey, some of you suggested that we could try and talk about that. So first of all, I'm just going to explain kind of the types of mood disorders. I mean, you guys might know most of these because you guys are kind of all intertwined with the mental health stuff. But I guess major depressive disorder, which is otherwise known as depression, is kind of obviously the main one. Dysthymia is a lower level depression, but it's for more than two years of onset and it's not as bad. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder is when you're like on your period and you have depression symptoms due to the onset of your period. Um, disruptive mood, mood dysregulation disorder is usually diagnosed in children and it's characterized by a depressed mood and tantrums basically, so um, disrupted in their mood. And there's substance slash medication induced depressed disorder, that's kind of self-explanatory. Unspecified or other specified depressive disorders, bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Um, bipolar disorder is in a different category of mental disorders, but it's still categorized as a mood disorder, if that makes sense. Bipolar 1 is characterized by going from a depressed episode to a manic episode. So like a depressed episode is two weeks or longer, and a manic episode is one week or longer, and it's the opposite of depressed. And then bipolar 2 disorder is when you go from a depressed episode to a hypomanic episode, which is kind of a lower level manic episode. Cytoclimic disorder, it's basically a lower level bipolar 1 and 2 disorder that persists for more than two years. Usually it's diagnosed as in like children and stuff. Um, and the difference between bipolar disorders and borderline personality disorder is that borderline personality disorders are characterized by switches in mood, but it's more frequent. So it's like minutes to hours, depending on the day. And then bipolar is weak. So I just kind of listed a few techniques to help with depression. A good one is acceptance and commitment techniques. So taking slow breaths, um, pressing your feet firmly into the ground, pressing your hands firmly together. You, you can scan your body for tension and notice things you can see around you, notice things you can hear around you, and notice things that you can touch. It's also known as grounding techniques, but the clinical name is acceptance and commitment techniques. And then there's also unhooking techniques, which is like to pause and check in on yourself and throughout the day. You can notice bodily sensations, which is also good, and kind of noticing your thoughts and trying to neutralize the negative thoughts or the intrusive thoughts, even though I know that's really difficult, but just trying to notice that they're there and that they're not real necessarily. And I think it's really important for us to understand compassion over criticism because we're kind of our worst critic on ourselves. And criticism is like an example. You should get out more. If you don't, get your act together. Things will never get better. Just don't act like such a failure. And kind of trying to neutralize that with a compassion statement instead and say, life can be really challenging sometimes. It can feel overwhelming when you think of everything you everything to do. So maybe just start with the first step. It may be one step forward and a couple steps back at first, but you deserve credit for even trying. So yeah, it's really important to try and neutralize the intrusive thoughts with a compassion statement and i kind of i have about like i think 15 points i want to go through and i put broke them up into fours so this is the four fundamentals of life so the first one i wanted to talk about was purpose so such as why and what is your purpose or mission that you want to achieve in life and the second one is connection i mean like at this time obviously we're all in quarantine so it's really difficult to find connection and, and socialize with people but trying to find other ways to do so is also very helpful laughter and connection is the key to happiness and connection does work even if it's online there's this oxy oxytocin in your brain that is triggered even just seeing people or talking to people and it could like and, and then it increases serotonin levels in your brain and it'll make you happier and I guess we kind of call that a deficiency, so people-to-people -people contact. Ages 12 to 18 need twice as much oxytocin development than adults. And it's great to reunify your sense of self, not just about other people. And yeah, I gotta remember that you're not psychic. So at least for me, what a great thing works for me is to, like, when there's a situation that someone's going through, asking them if they would like empathy 
advice or intervention or a combination of all of them is a great way to do it. Because if you don't, if you give like intervention and they only want empathy, then obviously that'll trigger them even more. So independence is the third one. And it's kind of saying unsafe is not okay, but uncomfortable is not unsafe. Ask yourself, what else do I need to do to learn the privilege for independence? So, I mean, right now we're all stuck in quarantine and our parents are probably really paranoid about going outside and that stuff. And it's just really important to understand that unsafe is not okay at this time, but uncomfortable is not unsafe. And then number four is fun, opportunities for fun and silly, silliness, working together to find value of fun. And I just want to kind of put a mental note out there to ask yourself which one appeals to you the most when moving through the discomfort. And this is kind of your opportunity to live your way and not other what other people want you to because we have all the free time in the world. So yeah, live your way and power through the difficulties. Everyone is different. And lead towards resilience. And resilience means kind of bouncing back from what you have been through and going through something and incorporating that experience to better yourself and others around you. So the next four, I call it STEM. It stands for sleep, think, eat, and move. So you must sleep better, and you need five complete sleep cycles, which is 90 minutes each, and you need seven to eight hours if you're 18 or over. You need nine hours if you're 12 to 17, and 10.5 hours if you're 12 and below. And the first half of sleeping, you actually learn what you're learning during the day, and the last half expands your creativity and problem-solving skills. And then, and your neurons in your brain actually shrink while you're sleeping and washes itself out. So it's really important to get enough sleep because it protects your brain, develops your brain. And I really encourage you guys to unplug from devices one hour before bed or at least 30 minutes. It's really important to try and do that. Number six is think clearly. So eliminate all distractions. So like your devices and all that stuff and eat smarter. Healthy proteins makes it easier to concentrate during the day. Healthy carbohydrates. Um, elevates energy levels and healthy fats protects the brain because your brain is actually mostly made out of fats so obviously you need fats otherwise it's gonna basically just eat itself and eating healthier actually makes you eat more food which is kind of interesting because if you line up like the same um, calories for non-healthy food and then the same calories of healthy food it quibbles out to eating more healthier foods than eating not healthy so it kind of just doesn't make sense to eat unhealthy. And there's actually a new thing called nutritious psychiatry, which psychiatrists are starting to use and develop therapies for using your diet to alleviate mental health stress and um, complications. Uh, number eight is exercise. So your brain comes to life when you exercise, obviously. Cardio exercises lengthens life. And strengthening your muscles and bones reduces the chance to get disease. So you might want to do that at this time, especially when we have a pandemic. So the four categories to a healthy life. Number nine is spiritual. So it doesn't necessarily mean religious, but kind of doing something that you really enjoy to do. So hobbies like music, drawing, singing. Uh, number 10 is physical. So example, sports, working out, and that's basically working on your body. And number 11 is intellectual, so it's really important to work your brain, such as school and work. And then social is the last one, which is partying, kind of activities with friends, socializing. <laughs> Studies actually show that you need at least two events in each category per week to really make a difference in your life and your mindset. So I really encourage you to try and get at least two events in each category. And I want to just talk about uh, thinking traps, which are the next four. Mind reading, is, um, this trap happens when we believe that we know that others are thinking. And we assume that they are thinking the worst of us. For example, others think I'm stupid. She doesn't like me. Number 14 is negative filter. This happens when we only pay attention to the bad things that happen, but ignore all the good things. This prevents us from looking at all aspects of the situation and drawing a more balanced conclusion. Example believing that you did a poor job on a presentation because some people looked bored, 
even though several people looked interested and you received several compliments on how well you did. So just trying to like neutralize the negative thoughts by understanding that your thoughts can be irrational sometimes. And number 15 is predicting the future. And this is when we predict that things will turn out badly. For example, I know I'll mess up and you predict things before it even happens. So it doesn't really make much sense, but it's just kind of a human thing that we all do. Uh, number 16 is labeling. So sometimes we talk to ourselves in mean ways and use a single negative word to describe ourselves. For example, I'm stupid. I'm a loser. Nobody's going to like me. Yeah, so understanding that these things are going through your brain and it's totally normal, just trying to neutralize that by knowing that it's irrational and not intentionally true. So I kind of wanted to explain how the brain works and how kind of mental health works as a whole. So situations happen, and that's kind of inevitable because it's going to happen. But then there's automatic thoughts and images that come along with the situations. And then there's the reactions, which are emotional, behavioral, or sociological. Now, with the situations, if you neutralize the thoughts and the images, then it doesn't get to the reaction. Because if you already have the automatic thoughts and images, you can't... It's really difficult to stop the reaction obviously so that also is the same with ticks so you have like a sensation you have the thought to do it and then you have the reaction which is the tick and in neutralizing that and trying to um like have reversal therapy or cbit is a great way to do it and obviously suppression is never good so i don't suggest doing that but just trying to understand that it happens and it's not your fault and that you can get through this <laughs> And I want to kind of talk about some advice with discomfort. So try and turn stress into an advantage. You have more opportunities to create the world that you want than ever before because there's nothing else to do. Um, and I guess that's what people are doing with the protesting. It's not exactly the um, most helpful way at the moment because we're in a pandemic, but I'm, I 100% stand by it. But be safe and be as in intentional as you can to get the connections that you can get. Think about the feelings you want to create and figure out a way to get those feelings in a different way. Stress is not a poison. Like everything, you need to exercise your stress. Too little stress is not good, and too much is not good as well. There is a sociological range for everything, and this range can do damage to your mental health or build a foundation to resilience. So I kind of wanted to explain three key questions for you guys we're not going to like necessarily answer these but just trying to think of these each and every day before you go to bed or once you wake up um, number one is what matters to me most and what matters to me overall how do i want to behave as a human being is a big one and how do i want to treat myself others or the world around me so I want to talk about a little bit about some psychology results. I did a survey in December, and I surveyed 150 people. There was three different surveys, and these are just a few of the results from that study. So you guys can look through the top four categories. I'm just going to look at the total at the bottom here. So in terms of anxiety, 70% of people said that they experience excessive anxiety, either socially or you know, generalize or agoraphobic or that kind of stuff. So 70%, that's a lot. <laughs> and for thinking traps is the next one. And it's the people that chose three or more of the thinking traps that they do on a regular basis. And that's 50% of them. So that's quite a bit. <laughs> and then there's paranoia. So paranoia means when you're paranoid that everybody around you typically hates you without any evidence to that. And so 51% of people believe that everybody around them hates them. And then the next category is unhealthy lifestyle. So that's the one with the um, spiritual, intellectual, physical, and social. And three or more people said that they, they do not do two or more events each week on those four categories. So that's 36%. Um, for loneliness, 60% of people said that they feel lonely at all times. And low self-esteem is the next one. And 85% of people said that they had low self-esteem. Um, and that just goes for show that we're really, we're not 
alone in this. We all feel the same feelings. We're all here together and we can get through it together. And potential mental disorders. So one out of five people is said to have a mental disorder, which is 20% of the population or 19 out of 95 people. So yeah. And here are just a few of the other results from my survey. So 90% of participants agreed that they are more concerned with themselves and how other people perceive them rather than in judging others. Uh, the next one is there is an 80% chance that your paranoia about someone is wrong. And only 10% of participants that consume an illegal substance takes part in order to fit in or to make it easier to socialize with others. And about 70% of us feel like we're an outsider, but 70% of us feel that everyone else is normal and is not an outsider. So basically, it's completely irrational because nobody else is thinking that you're an outsider. Um, so the next one I want to talk about was how to manage tics. So the first one I brought up is sleep. So 65% of people with TS or tic-related symptoms have symptoms of a sleep disorder. This can affect our emotional regulation, such as the flight or fight response, and will help with decreasing anxiety throughout the day and regular, regulates anger and mood. So here are just kind of the ABCs of sleep, like the basics of sleep. So number one is kind of age appropriate bedtimes and wake times. Two is schedules and routines, making sure that it, it's the same routine every day. Um, and the location, so making sure you're comfortable, your bed is comfortable, there's no people distracting you. Um, exercise and diet, so having exercise during the day and eating healthy. And no electronics in the bedroom or before bed is a big one. And positivity, um, just staying positive about it and trying to keep trying to sleep and do it as best you can. And independence when falling asleep. Um, so there's nobody distracting you, nobody's around you, nobody's calling you and the needs of the child are met during the day. So this is kind of a big one, especially with tic disorders, um, to make sure that you're getting the support that you need throughout the day from either your school or just your family in, in general. Um, but it's really important. And you need equal and great sleep for each day and try and get the same amount of sleep. The next one I wanted to point out was self-care. So obviously mindfulness, find your, find your hobby slash take breaks from stress so i mean even if you do a hobby for a really long time sometimes it can get a little stressful and you can get overwhelmed it's okay to be stressed out and you can take breaks which again i'm a hypocrite for that and to make sure that you update your support systems as much as you can update them on new ticks update them on what is a tick and that kind of stuff and context slash environment so there's behavior and then to consequences so kind of trying to neutralizing the thoughts before the behavior happens um, can help build consequences or break them down and the next one is obviously relationships so trying to keep those connections slash social um, social life even if it's really difficult even just going for a walk with a friend social distancing as much as possible and just doing the best you can so the last thing i wanted to really talk about was um, there's this poem called The Dash by Linda Ellis, and I thought it was really good. I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates of the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said that mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth, and now only those who love them know that little line is worth for it matters not how much we own the cars the house the cash what matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash think about this long and hard are there things you'd like to change for you never know how much time is left that still can be arranged to be less quick to anger and show appreciation for more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before if we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to relash, would you be proud of the things that they say about you and how you lived your dash? And this is kind of one of my own quotes that I 
came up with. I called it Shattered. And it just kind of says, um, lost in a shadow, falling through the glass, scrambling to pick up the pieces only to find a mess. Life doesn't make sense. Sometimes you must let go of something you love in order to find the shadow that reconnects the pieces. So it's kind of explaining that you, even though it can be really difficult and trying to let go of the people that bring you down instead of bring you up and not being afraid to connect those pieces and to find someone that reconnects them and builds you up. And yeah, that's kind of it. So do you guys have any questions or advice that you would like to ask the group?